The death of Albert Schweitzer and the hospital he built on the west coast of Africa has caused mourning in many parts of the world during the past week. Whatever Christians may think of his theology, Albert Schweitzer will go down as one of the great humanitarians of the 20th century. He was one of the greatest organists in the world. He was one of the greatest philosophers of our century. Albert Schweitzer could have had fortune and luxury, but he chose to lose himself in a steaming jungle for nearly 50 years helping those in need. As the whole world admired the self-discipline and self-poverty of Gandhi, so the whole world admired the self-sacrifice of Albert Schweitzer. Albert Schweitzer once said, death is not the end, but only the beginning. We are reminded of a text in the Bible that will never be very popular because of its morbid truth. The text is, it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Our appointment with death is one that none of us want to keep. Physical life is a possession we all hold on to tenaciously, and yet we all know that we must sooner or later bow to the grim reaper and place in his bony hands the prize of life. Shakespeare once wrote, Golden lads and all girls must, as chimney sweepers come to dust. By medicine life may be prolonged, yet death will seize the doctor too. Every year nearly two million Americans die. This is equal to the combined populations of Denver, Kansas City, Indianapolis, and Atlanta. According to the National Safety Council, there's an accidental death in America every six minutes. And every 14 minutes, someone dies in an automobile accident. The modern car has proved to be one of the Grim Reaper's most efficient assistants in reaping his annual harvest. Death hangs over our heads from the cradle to the grave. It stalks the little child. It plagues the youth. It hovers over us in middle age. It haunts us in old age. And it catches up with us for certain at the end. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. All that man builds, he builds on the edge of his grave. He builds his great universities. He builds his great empires. But he builds on the edge of his grave because all the human race at this hour is going straight toward the grave. That is the end of every one of us outside of Jesus Christ. But of course for those in Christ, there's a tremendous hope beyond the grave. The Bible teaches that death is no respecter of persons. It enters the palace as boldly as it enters the humble cottage. It makes victims of the rich as easily as it does the poor. It brings down the curtain as swiftly on the famous as it does on the humble and the unknown. Think of the famous people who have died recently. Gary Cooper, James Thurber, Sam Rabin, Ernest Hemingway, Thomas Dooley, Joan Davis, Barry Fitzgerald, Moss Hart, Eleanor Roosevelt, Marilyn Monroe, Jeff Chandler, Winston Churchill, Adlai Stevenson, and many others. And before this year has ended, other famous people will have kept their appointment with death. And you, this year, may keep your appointment with death. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. Fame and fortune cannot delay our appointment with death. When Queen Elizabeth I lay dying, she whispered, All my possessions and my crown for a moment of time. But she could strike no bargain with death. She couldn't put it off even a few minutes. Tis he who has the last word with monarch and commoners, with famous and infamous, with leaders and the led, with intelligent and illiterate, all men, regardless of rank, must come before death. It is appointed unto man once to die. I have found that you can tell just how a man values life by his estimate of death. Tell me what a man believes about death and I will tell you what he thinks of life. I've discovered that there are three philosophies about death. The first is, when I'm dead, I'm dead. I'll take my chances on the hereafter. This is the philosophy of men who see the drum of life without plot or purpose or finale. They see life as a meaningless puzzle, the working of which is not worth the trouble. Life to them is a maze in which we wander aimlessly around for our lifespan, never once catching a glimpse of a higher destiny. The Bible speaks of such as aliens from the commonwealth and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Such despairing souls go not only against clear Christian teaching, but against the trend of man's universal hopes and aspirations of the future life. 
The future existence of the soul has been held as a matter of popular belief by the people of every age and culture. It is found among the Chinese, the Egyptians, the Persians, all the ancient peoples. Its evidences lie so heavily upon the constitution of man that universally people believe in life after death. To the man who says, when I'm dead, I'm dead, let me ask what proof he bases his belief. At least the man who believes in immortality, as most men do, has on his side the weight of universal belief, the teaching of the scriptures and the creeds of all religions. If I were to buy a ticket on a plane and the agent said there's one chance in ten that you won't make it, I would ask for a refund and refuse to board the airplane. Even from the rational, intellectual viewpoint, there is a strong, logical possibility that death does not end our existence. And as long as that possibility exists, no logical person, no reasonable person should gamble with his eternal soul. Jesus took the trouble to give us a parable about such a man who thought that earthly existence was the chief end of man. This man toiled, prospered, and grew old. The only heaven he had hoped for was security, and he attained it. He said, I will say to my soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. He said, I will take my chances, but he gambled and lost. He lost his chances of eternal life, and his soul ended with a dull thud on the shores of eternity. He had a shallow, materialistic view of death, and he went into the great beyond as empty as he had lived. There are thousands of people just like that that I'm talking to at this moment. But ladies and gentlemen, you have an appointment with death, and the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. The second philosophy about death goes something like this. I believe in life after death, but I'm not concerned about crossing that bridge until I get to it. A lot of people say that to me when I try to witness to them. I ask young people, what do you think of the fact of death? And he answers something like this, I'm too excited and thrilled about life to think about that. There will be time later on. I ask a man, what do you think of death? Oh, I'm too busy to think. A man must make a living, you know. Middle age, what do you think about death? Well, I'm too anxious about other things. Death will have to wait. Old age, what do you think of death? Are you ready to die? I'm too muddled to think. My habits are too fixed to change. On the deathbed. Now what do you think of death? To you that are dying. Are you ready to meet your maker? Many times the answer comes back. It's too late to think. My mind is blurred by drugs. Oh God help me. Strange, isn't it, that we should spend 20 years or more preparing for a life's vocation and not take so much as five minutes to prepare to meet God? Did your master go to heaven, the servant of a rich man was asked? No, sir, came the reply. My master always made careful preparations when he was going someplace, and I didn't notice him getting ready to go anywhere. The Bible says that we're all going somewhere. We're going to the grave. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then after that, the judgment. We're going to the grave, and we're going to judgment. This is a divine fact that warrants the most careful human preparation. Nothing in life is more important than your appointment with death. Prepare to meet thy God was and is the wisest and most important advice ever given to man. The third and the sanest attitude toward death is this. I stand with Christ the Lord of life and death and rest my case in his hands. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Here is a trumpet of hope that has echoed through every cemetery of this world and made the experience of death not a bitter end, but a bright dawning. Christ our Lord, who went down into the grave himself, but came forth with the keys of death and hell in his pocket, takes our trembling hand, leads us to the edge of the grave and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The Bible is very specific about immortality. It says many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Victor Hugo in his old age said, When I go down to the grave, I can say like so many others, I have finished my day's work, but I cannot say I finished my life. 
My next day's work will begin the next morning. My tomb is not a blind alley, it is a thoroughfare. It closes with the twilight, it opens with the dawn. Joseph Addison, when dying, sent for his stepson, Lord Warwick, a young man who had lived a bad life. When he arrived, Addison said to him, I have sent for you, my son, that you may see how a Christian can die. John Huss, the day before he was burned at the stake, wrote, I write this in prison and in chains, expecting tomorrow to receive sentence of death, full of hope in God that I shall not swerve from the truth, nor adjure errors imputed to me by false witnesses. In the truth which I have proclaimed according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, I will this day die joyfully. Shortly before his death, Augustine asked that these words from the 32nd Psalm be written on the wall opposite his bed. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And gazing upon these words, the great Augustine died in peace and went to meet God. When Benjamin Parsons was dying, he was asked how he felt. He replied, my head is resting sweetly on three pillars, infinite power, infinite wisdom, and infinite love. At least the skeptics must concede that a true Christian knows how to die. When Dr. W. E. Sangster, England's great Methodist preacher, lay dying with muscular atrophy, he wrote me a letter. He said, Billy, all my life I've preached that Jesus Christ is adequate for every crisis. I have but a few days to live. And oh, Billy, Christ is indeed adequate in the hour of death. Tell everyone it is true. Tell them for me that God is wonderfully near his children when they come to the end of life's road. What is your attitude toward death? Have you a hope that extends beyond this realm of time and space? You can have. You can be ready to face death at any moment with Christ by your side. And having prepared for death, you will be ready to live. Yes, everything we build and everything we do is on the edge of our grave. It is appointed unto man once to die. Are you ready to die? Are you going to be one of the National Safety Council statistics this year? Are you going to be another statistic in cancer or in heart disease? This may be your year, 1965, when you will die. Are you ready to meet God? You say, but Billy, how am I made to be ready? You can be made ready by receiving Christ as your Savior, repenting of your sins, receiving Him as your Savior right now, riding in an automobile, sitting in your living room, lying in bed at a hospital. Wherever you're listening to this broadcast, you can say yes to Christ. He can come into your heart now. He will forgive all the past and give you a totally new dimension and power of living if you will trust Him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is alive. He is not a dead Christ. He is not in a grave. He is living at this moment. And he's ready to come and live in your heart and give you eternal life. And when you come to die, he will be there on the deathbed with you. When you go through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be there. And the Bible says there's going to be a glorious resurrection for all of those that are in Jesus Christ. So the fear of death is gone. We look forward to it with joy because Christ is going to be with us. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that the Spirit of God will give us the hope of the resurrection this day. And we pray that as the grim reaper calls on us, that we will be ready in Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Next Friday night, May the 16th, we begin a major evangelistic crusade in Portland, Oregon. More than two years ago, when we accepted an invitation to hold this crusade in Portland, we did not realize that it would be just before the Oregon primary that would be attracting international attention. Most of the major candidates are on the ballot here, and scores of newspaper men and television personalities are in Oregon to report on this crucial primary. In the midst of all this political activity, this evangelistic crusade will be held. Thousands of Christians have been working and praying for many months, and we believe that hundreds are going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We would appreciate the prayers of Christians throughout the world that this beautiful city of roses will experience a spiritual awakening that could have a moral and spiritual impact on the entire northwestern part of the United States where less people attend church than any other part of the nation. 
Our television screens have also been occupied with stories of the Poor People's March on Washington. This march must make millions of people throughout the world smile, because the average income of the marchers is far above that of most people in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and even millions in Europe. There is no doubt that terrible poverty exists, not only in the ghettos of America, but in many other areas of the country as well. Yet in comparison to many other parts of the world, even the people in the ghetto, with clothes to wear, food to eat, and various social services to call upon, have far more than millions of poor people in other parts of the world. Yet to the affluent American, the fact that any poverty exists at all should be a challenge. The scriptures teach in Proverbs 21, 13, Whosoever stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. The scripture also teaches, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. Thus the Bible teaches that Christians have a tremendous responsibility to the poor in their society. Yet on the other hand, the writer of the book of Proverbs says, Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. And the psalmist said, A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. This indicates that there is a spiritual wealth that is far greater than the material benefits that an affluent society can offer. Many times we get our values confused. We've been brainwashed by thousands of advertisements on television, radio, and in the newspapers that tell us night and day that if we use a certain brand of soap or a certain type of deodorant or ride in a certain kind of automobile, it will bring peace, happiness, joy, and youthfulness. Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? He indicated that the spirit of man is far more valuable than a man's body. One of the great dangers in the teaching of the church today is that man can find happiness and even redemption in material benefits. Thus, much of the activity of the church is now taken up with social activism rather than spiritual development. Indeed, there is a strong social emphasis in the New Testament, but the primary emphasis is upon personal salvation. Perhaps we Christians need a march on Washington to dramatize the nation's moral and spiritual condition and man's lost condition before God and his need of personal salvation. It seems that the only way to get attention today is to have a march, a demonstration, or a riot. During the past few weeks, we've been following with almost unbelief the student revolution on campus after campus throughout America. At Columbia University, a small militant group of revolutionary students physically seized control of five major university buildings, occupied and vandalized the office of the president, held the dean of the college prisoner for 24 hours, and brought one of America's greatest universities to a complete halt and almost to its knees. These students were so highly organized and so well versed in Marxist tactics of revolution that Newsweek magazine said it had the quality of an amateur enactment in modern dress of the storming of the Winter Palace that led to the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. At universities throughout the world, students are rioting and demonstrating this spring. In some cases, a minority of faculty members are the brains behind the revolts. The techniques of student dissent are much the same throughout the world. There is much evidence that these students are being taught and led by professionals. These youthful radicals have made guerrilla tactics a new medium of protest. The peaceful demonstrations are now a thing of the past. The new emphasis is on civil disobedience, violence, and open revolt. The ultimate goal of many of these young radicals is to bring down the United States government and make America a socialist state to conform to that of Castro's Cuba or Mao Zedong's Red China. Most Americans say that these are only small but violent minorities. That is true, but it was only a small and violent minority of teenagers and students that led the French Revolution. It was a small, violent minority of teenagers and students that Lenin used to overthrow the Russian government. 
It was a small minority of teenagers and students that Castro used to overthrow the Cuban government. Most Americans cannot believe that it will happen in America. But the truth is, it is happening now. And it is going to get far worse until the American people wake up to what is happening to them. Whether we wake up in time or not is doubtful. Most Americans will applaud the statement of former Vice President Richard Nixon when he said this past week in Nebraska, the right to dissent must be protected, but no right to dissent can cover what has been going on in this country in recent years. In this last week, said Mr. Nixon, we've seen disorderly and violent students paralyze Columbia University in a gross violation of public order and the rights of other students. Worse, he said, We've seen this contemptible conduct condoned and encouraged by a handful of naive professors and teachers who happen to agree with the students' goals. These men and others of stature and eminence who have given their blessing to public lawlessness are largely responsible for the disintegration of respect for the rule of law in America. End quote. A quote by former Vice President Richard Nixon. In the meantime, we as a team have dedicated ourselves to intensified efforts in the field of evangelism this summer here in the United States. We believe that our job at this violent hour is to proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified and risen again as the only hope for man's personal salvation and society's redemption. Confronted with evidences of spiritual and moral decay on every hand, we now find ourselves more frequently looking for relief from the consequences of what is happening rather than the cause and cure of the desperate situation in which America finds itself. History records for all to see that many nations have been destroyed not by an enemy from without, but by the deterioration which is evidenced by immorality, dishonesty, greed, pride, and revolt from within. The blind man replied to Jesus' question as to whether he saw anything by saying, I see men as trees walking. Such eyesight was quite unsatisfactory, and Jesus touched him so that he saw every man clearly. Apparently some of us today have not had our eyes treated recently, and as a result, we have a blurred picture of God in sin. We have come to the point where we do not know where Christianity stops and where modern society begins. The good life has become inseparable with the maximum possible consumption of things. We have become secularistic and materialistic without meaning to be. And we have also become soft. We are letting the country go to pot by default. Where are the leaders with courage to speak the truth and then do something about it? Since we cannot believe it is happening, we're undisturbed about it and flit about in our little orbits, blissfully unaware of the tragedy occurring in this generation. The Bible many times warns that toward the end of history, there will be a return to worldwide violence, immorality, wickedness, and intensified wars. Christ warned, likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat. They drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Christ said there's going to come a future day of judgment. As that great day of judgment draws even nearer, we see these very things happening about us in the world in which we live. It would seem that we were reading an article in a modern magazine when we read Paul's words to Timothy. Listen to this. But know this, that in the last days grievous times shall set in. For men shall be lovers of self, lovers of money and boastful, haughty and profane. They will be disobedient to parents, thankless, irreligious, hard-hearted, unforgiving, slanderous. They will have no self-control but will be brutal, opposed to goodness, treacherous, headstrong, self-important. They will love pleasure instead of loving God and will keep up a make-believe of religion and yet exclude its power. This certainly leaves no room for doubt as to what the world is going to be just before the climactic events that shall ring down the curtain on history. These are the closing days according to the scriptures, and these are the things that will happen in these closing days. All ancient civilizations have gone down to destruction through sin. 
Rome went on a gigantic spree before the end of her history, just as the Western world has been doing now for the past few years. Rome's overthrow came almost without warning. Today, the world is heading in the same direction. The world's Nero's are emerging in seats of power and thoughtless people by the millions, surrounded by evidence of a coming storm the likes of which has never been known, madly and merrily dance their way to judgment in hell. In the 13th chapter of Matthew, Jesus said, in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barns. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, then shall the righteous shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are those that have a caricature of Christ. They think of him only as a man of sentimental, gushy love. But the greatest burden of his teaching was that of judgment. He warned time after time of coming judgment and told the people that unless they repented, they would also perish. Have you repented? Are you prepared for the judgment day? God says, prepare to meet thy God. How do you prepare? By repenting of your sins and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You could do it right now. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank thee and praise thee that there is a hope in Jesus Christ at this hour of history. And we pray that thousands of people listening to my voice throughout the world may turn at this moment from their sins to Christ and find the forgiveness and the love and the mercy that he offers. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Bill Yenga, I deeply appreciate those gracious and generous words. Governor and Mrs. Nye, Mayor and Mrs. Coates, Richard Clements, Ed Cook, Bishop Bart, all of those here at the head table and distinguished guests that are here. I apologize because the doctor did not want me to come here today due to the fact that uh, when I arrived here I was looking forward to seeing some sunshine and uh, having a little bit of rest and I came a little bit early and slipped into town and immediately went to bed with uh, whatever I've got. Uh, when they don't know what you've got, they call it a virus. And uh, it's like the man that went to see the doctor and uh, the doctor couldn't diagnose the case and he said, well, uh, have you ever had this before? And he said, yes, I have several times. He said, well, you've got it again. <laughs> and uh, that's what I've got. I've got it again. I think I got it from some of my grandchildren because my wife is sick at home in bed with the same thing, whatever it is. But in the last 18 months, uh, we've been in various parts of the United States and Canada, Mexico, France, Britain, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Holland, spoken on many university campuses, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, uh, University of Maine, Vermont, University of North Carolina, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, and different universities as well as in great stadiums everywhere and uh, several times in Washington and almost everywhere I go I find both leaders and ordinary individuals are asking one basic question is there hope for the future our young people are asking that question and there's a great deal of despair they're asking it because the dominant characteristic of life today throughout the world is a climate of fear Fear of the future, fear of a world that seems almost out of control, fear of economic recession. And beneath it all is a feeling of almost despair or dread, a feeling of deep pessimism that anything can really be done to stop the present trend toward war or toward economic collapse because I don't care how good the stock market is, we are broke and we are more than broke and we're spending our great, 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 great grandchildren's money. And I remember talking to the Secretary of the Treasury one day and I said, uh, not the present one, but a former one, 
And I said, what is the situation economically? He said, Billy, we're broke and we've been broke for a long time. And he said, one day the whole thing is going to come tumbling down. I don't know about that. I don't understand economics. I remember a man there told me one day, he said, you know, you ought to run for president except you don't know much about economics. And I said, well, that's not the reason I'm not running, but, uh, <laughs> but there's a difference between an optimist and a pessimist, and it was highlighted in one of our prisons. Two convicts were looking out of a cell window one night, and the pessimist saw only the bars. The optimist saw the stars. And in our world today, we see both. And uh, there was a demonstration in London uh, recently, and I saw on the television, on the back of one of the demonstrators among the young people, said no future. The suicide rate has doubled in two years for those under 19. What kind of people will it take to help solve our problems, whether it be in the home, the community, the nation, or the world? What must be the characteristic of a true leader? All of you here today are leaders. The first quality I would like to mention is integrity. It means a man is the same on the inside as he claims to be on the outside. There's no discrepancy between what he says and what he does, between his walk and his talk. A man of integrity can be trusted, and he's the same person alone in his hotel room a thousand miles from home as he is at church or in his community or in his home. Solomon wrote long ago, the man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. One of the greatest gifts that God gives a man is the ability to lie down at night, satisfied with who he is, what he's done that day, because he's acted with integrity. The second quality I believe is necessary for leadership during these difficult days is personal security. I do not mean this in the sense of physical security or job security. Newsweek magazine ran an article some time ago entitled Uneasy Men at the Top. They described the job insecurities of some in top levels of corporate management in large companies. It set the stage for one newly installed CEO to say in jest, I didn't mind it when they wrote my, when they wrote my name on the office door in chalk, but I did think it was a little unethical to have a wet sponge hanging from the doorknob. <laughs> but I'm instead talking about personal and emotional security the kind which comes from knowing and accepting who we are, why we're here, and where we're going. I do not believe that that kind of security comes from our careers alone. The trouble with total devotion to a career is that businesses are not set up to provide emotional satisfaction. If the organization changes, or if your job changes, the emotional satisfaction you get from your work may decrease sharply, and you're left with no other source of support. And then when retirement comes, you have nothing else to turn to. Psychiatrist Dr. Glenn Swagger recommended for avoiding that type of vulnerability is to diversify your emotional portfolio. And part of that diversification should include a proper emphasis on the spiritual aspect of your life. You're not just a body or a mind. God created you with a spiritual nature. And that's one reason why I believe that the only real source of lasting security is found in Christ. Only in Him do we find out who we are, why we're here, and where we're going. As a person comes to know God in a real and personal way, he becomes truly secure. Personal security includes a sense of inner peace, peace with God, and peace with oneself. Jesus said to his followers, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Besides integrity and personal security, the third quality which is necessary in a leader is a sense of priority. This is the ability to separate the important from the unimportant, the critical from the trivial, vital from the insignificant, the eternal from the temporary. Until a man gets his priorities in life straight, Everything else is going to be out of order. My friend, Dr. Roy Menninger, head of the Menninger Foundation, tells businessmen, quote, as successful executives, most of you are adept at planning, but most of you don't give much attention to your own life plan and the direction you're going and why. 
Most of us live from day to day so swamped by the pressures and details of daily life that we don't take the time to think about our goals in life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. And once that priority has been established, then the rest of life can be seen and lived in a proper perspective. Without a proper attitude toward God, everything else in life will eventually take on more importance than it's supposed to have. I heard about one chairman of the board who wanted to see the president of his company, and he went in, the secretary said, I'm sorry, he's in a conference, he can't be disturbed at this time, and he swore and opened the door, he said, he'll see me, and he walked in and he saw the president of the company down on his knees in prayer. And he backed slowly out, and he said to the secretary, I can now see why he's so successful. He's got his priorities straight. Do you have your priorities straight? Then there's one final quality that I would mention briefly, the quality of vision. This is the quality of seeing what can be and ought to be done and how to get there. I'm sure that you all know companies where management has lost its vision and gradually the business deteriorates and becomes outdated. But I have in mind something greater than just a vision for your respected business. Our world today desperately needs people of vision, men and women who believe they have a responsibility to God and to their fellow men and have a vision for helping build a better society, getting the big picture. It's far too easy for any of us to become involved in a narrow, self-centered way in the pursuit of our own little goals and to forget that we have a larger obligation, an obligation to God first, to our family, to our neighbor. A man who refuses that obligation is not a true leader, no matter how successful his balance sheet may, may be. As a Christian, I believe the highest vision we can have is a determination to do God's will in this world. And that means we thrust ourselves into the great issues of our day and accept the responsibility to be leaders in shaping the future. How can we be the kind of person we ought to be? Father, mother, child, whatever, in the home, in the community. I believe that we're made in the image of God. We're made in the moral and spiritual image of God. And living down inside your body is your spirit, your soul that's going to live forever. And that part of us is being neglected in our generation. We spend so much time watching the television. We spend so much time reading the papers. So much time with all the other things in life that we don't sit down and really think through. The fact that we are made in God's image for fellowship with God and without that fellowship with God, you will never find the answer that you're searching for. We're searching for something to commit ourselves to, a song to sing, a flag to follow. That person can be Jesus Christ. When I accepted him as the Son of God, repented of my sins and received him, it turned my life around, I didn't become perfect. But I had a new goal. There was a new optimism, a new joy, a new peace, and a love for my neighbor that I never had before. And that can happen to anyone at any time that you're willing to put your trust in him. So I challenge you to be individuals who are committed to Jesus Christ because only in him can you know what it fully means to have integrity and personal security and priority and vision. And as we yield ourselves to him and come to a personal relationship with him and then walk day by day with him and follow his word, then we discover the qualities of leadership we need and also the strength we need. For he alone exhibited these qualities of leadership perfectly in his own life. It's been said that when God made the oyster, he guaranteed it absolute economic and social security. He built the oyster a house, his shell, to shelter and protect him from his enemies. And when he was hungry, the oyster simply opens his shell and food rushes in for him. He has freedom from want. But when God made the eagle, he declared the blue sky is the limit. Build your own home. So the eagle builds on the highest mountain. Storms threaten him every day. For food, he flies through miles of rain and snow and wind. And yet, which one of us would rather be an oyster than an eagle? It's my prayer that the words of the great prophet Isaiah 
would ring true in your lives as you rise to the challenges before you. In the 40th chapter, Isaiah said, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This can be your experience as you commit yourself to Christ and determine by his grace to help give fresh leadership to this community and to our world. If we don't, there's a strong possibility that we will witness Armageddon in our generation. In your business, in your personal life, in your home life, in our world, there is hope, but there's only one hope, and that's in the person of Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Thank you, and God bless you. During this past year, we have all been reminded of the brevity of time. Plane crashes, automobile wrecks, and tragic fires have reminded millions of Americans how quickly life can be snuffed out. The Bible tells us that life is extremely brief and describes it as a tale that is told, a weaver's shuttle, as grass that withers and flowers that fade. As we flick the calendar to a new year, we come face to face with the fact that our days on this earth are numbered. In a flight over the Atlantic Ocean, an airplane reaches what has become known as the point of no return. This means that the plane has gone more than half the distance of the flight and that now it is closer to the landing field in Europe than it is from the starting point in New York or Boston. From any such point of no return, no matter what happens, the pilot will have to go forward to his destination. As we face the new year, we too have reached another point of no return. Yesterday is in the past. Its events are already in the books of God's remembrance. Dr. W. E. Sangster reminds us that all our life we are slaves of time. He says that half of mankind is crucified upon a clock. There is no doubt that time does dog us like a demon from our tenderest years. When we were children, we were haunted by time. About the most unpleasant remarks we ever hear as children are, it's time to go to bed, or it's time to get up, or it's time to brush your teeth, or it's time to study, or it's time for homework, or it's time for music practice. Even children become slaves to time. The older you get, the more insistent the clock becomes. Millions go to factories every day and punch a time clock. There seems to be no pity and no mercy from the clock. Other millions also know the imprisonment of time, racing from engagement to engagement, fitting this in with that, giving five minutes here and 15 minutes there. Time haunts us all. The Bible puts it this way. What is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a time, then vanisheth away. Ignatius, one of the early church fathers, when he heard a clock strike, was accustomed to say, I have one more hour to answer for. The psalmist said, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. No thoughtful person can approach New Year's Day without some introspection. We look back over the failures, the mistakes, the missed opportunities, and vow that we will make better use of our time during the new year. Some do it by sheer resolve, by a flexing of their moral muscles, by a determination to be a better person in the future. Most of us never live up to our New Year's resolutions. David, in great humility, said, So teach us to number our days. He recognized that one of the root causes of man's failure was the failure to take God into account. We were simply not made to cope with temptation, evil, and our inner conflicts all by ourselves. The do-it-yourself craze simply cannot function in the spiritual realm, no matter how hard we try. Human history is told in the words of the psalmist, because they rebelled against the Lord and condemned the counsel of the Most High, they fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of all their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands asunder. The destiny of nations and individuals is bound up with their attitude toward God. This earth, in a mysterious way, is inseparably bound up with heaven. 
The prayer that all of us should make as we stand on the threshold of the new year is this. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Time actually has little meaning in heaven. There are no calendars in eternity. Yet because of the shortness of our time on earth, this prayer of David should be ours also. Because, first, today is the only hold we have on eternity. No man can really say, I know that I will be living tomorrow. Although it is a morbid thought, it is true that the threat of life is so brittle and so uncertain that none of us can boast that we own one second of the future. This moment, this one golden hour is God's gift to us. And the only segment of time that we can really call our own is the one we are now living. That is why the Bible is so explicit about the importance of the present. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. That is why it is important to come to Christ now while you can. The sin that has haunted you and ensnared you and hindered you. And you've said a thousand times, I will someday ask God to forgive me and get rid of this evil in my life. Do it today. Now is the proper time. This is the only moment you can lay claim to and within it lies the opportunity to begin a new life for God. There is a person toward whom you have harbored ill will. It happened long ago, but the festering sore of malice has lingered in your heart through the years. Many times you have said, Someday I will go to that person and we will make things right and I will get rid of these blighting feelings. When will you do it? Do it now! Now is the accepted time. It will never be easier than today. Many of you listening to my voice have said, Someday I will trust Christ. But you have been putting it off year after year, and through the years your heart has grown harder. You may not be conscious of the fact that it is now easier to resist God's call than it was a year ago. Make that commitment and that decision today, and enter into the year with Christ in your heart. There are few mistakes more common or more tragic than that of counting on the future. Cecil Rhodes planned big things in Africa, but he died at 49, saying, So much to do, so little done. Keats died at 25, Shelley at 30, Byron at 36. Friends had prophesied for each of them a great future, but not one of them even reached middle age. You cannot count with any confidence on tomorrow. When you take a job, you accept certain conditions of contract, a month's notice either way, or a week's. There is no such contract when you accept life. A moment's notice may be all that you will receive. This is the only hold that you have on eternity. Take advantage of it. Receive Christ while you can, because there may never be another hour like this for you. Secondly, we should number our days and apply our hearts unto wisdom, because the day is lost which does not add to our knowledge of God and His Word. We are to grow, the Scripture says, in wisdom, and apply our hearts unto wisdom. In eternity's scale of values, that day is lost, which has no word of praise, no prayer of thanks, and no contact with God. Prayer and praise are not occasional notes on the organ of life. They are pipes in the organ, the absence of which means serious loss to the music of life. It means discord instead of harmony. To most of us, the scriptures are an untapped treasure. This mine of spiritual gold lies unopened and unused within arm's length of every one of us while we grovel in spiritual poverty. Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. How little a segment of eternity is this brief period called time, and yet we squander it so foolishly on the sensations of time and space with little or no thought of eternity. Either we're going to live forever, or the Bible has misled us. If it has engaged in the slightest trace of deception, we're foolish to follow it. However, every fiber of our being echoes the certainty of eternity. All peoples throughout history have believed in life after death. By faith, we accept the biblical revelation that this life is only a dressing room for eternity. The Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We should resolve during the coming year to use our time to develop the sinews of our souls. This should be a year of spiritual growth for all of us. Thirdly, we are to number our days and apply our hearts unto wisdom because we should find in our hearts a desire to live an outgoing, outflowing life in the context not of time but of eternity, a spirit-filled life, a life directed by the Holy Spirit, a life of daily victory. A king once said, I count that day lost 
in which I have done no good thing. We should take time to be pleasant and to smile. I've found all over the world that all peoples of all races and cultures respond to a smile. There is so much unpleasantness in this world in which we live, but the Bible says the kingdom of God is peace and joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. The small courtesies, which we often omit because we feel they are of no value, will someday look larger to us than the wealth and the fame for which we struggle so hard. Let us take time this year to show love to our families. Psychiatrists tell us that most people who come to them are starved for love. Let us take time for the goodbye kiss. We shall go to work with a sweeter spirit. Let us take time to get acquainted with our families. All the wealth which you busy fathers are so busy accumulating is no substitute to your child whom you have no time to caress. We are not machines. We are not robots. The art of living and the secret of a happy home is for the members of the family to learn to give and to receive love. Let us take time this year to express our love in a thousand ways. When we're gone, our families will remember us, not for our business sense, nor for our wealth or cleverness, but for our love. Now abideth faith, hope, and love, but the greatest and the most abiding is love. Let us take time for family devotions. Too many families have left all matters of religion to the church, but the greatest the most lasting lessons of faith are learned when a mother's or a father's voice is lifted in reverence to God in prayer. A prayer together at the close of the day will make sleep come easier and will absolve the little hurts and harsh words of the day. Then lastly, take time this year to get better acquainted with Christ. The hour is coming for all of us when one touch of his hand will mean more to us than all that is written in the ledges of our social world. The only time we have is now. It is in the very nature of time that it comes to you moment by moment. Someone once tried to scare Will Rogers, the cowboy philosopher, by asking him, if you had only 48 hours to live, how would you spend them? Will Rogers replied, one at a time. God's forgiveness is now. The trouble is that although God says today, we so often say tomorrow. We say tomorrow I will begin a new life, or tomorrow I will walk with God. Then when tomorrow comes, you are still saying tomorrow, and so the years pass. Will death come and find you still saying tomorrow, tomorrow? Don't say tomorrow, say today I will receive Christ. Today, if you will hear his voice, God has promised not only to live with us, but in us. God the Holy Spirit will come and dwell in any heart now. Anyone who truly desires him, who will meet his conditions, may receive him, and he will take up his residence now. Today, if you will harden not your heart, what a glad farewell to the old year, knowing that all of our sins and all our failures are gone. What a fearlessness concerning all that the future may have in store. I'm not saying later on that phrase that you so hated in your childhood. This is the word of the Savior to you now, today if you will hear his voice. Will you come to Christ and make this the day of your salvation as you put your faith and confidence in him? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that today we will receive Christ and that we will not continue hardening our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.